Hi everyone, my name is Antoinette Winkler Prince and I'm currently the program director for the environmental programs here at AAP. I was also an instructor on the Nepal course, now called Climate Change Adaptation and Development in Nepal, which will be taking place again in January of 2017. Uh, I went on it when it ran in January of 2015, and this PowerPoint is to give you a sense of what this course, this very exciting course, is all about. Um, so, you know, why go to, uh, to Nepal, um, and why learn about what's happening there in terms of climate change? <clears throat> well, many reasons to do so. Uh, it's a fascinating country, and it's really at that cutting edge of uh, of looking at climate change adaptation in a place where climate change is really happening very quickly. Um, so back in 2015, a large group of us went. It was a combination of a graduate course in the ESP program as well as an undergraduate course from the Homewood campus. So, and we had a few Nepali students with us as well. And uh, we traveled all over the country. And uh, the course in 2017 will follow some of the same uh, trajectory. So Nepal and climate change. It is a country that uh, emits very little of global carbon emissions. Uh, however, it is subject to a number of the changes uh, as a result of global carbon emissions at a much greater significance than elsewhere um, around the world. Um, because of its location, uh, and its uh, various ecological settings, um, it is already seeing changes in its temperature uh, rainfall, so increases in temperature, especially in their winter season, uh, change in their rainfall intensity and in the timing of that rainfall, and the melting of glaciers, um, which can cause some significant problems downstream from those, uh, from those locations. Um, given the country's extremely high dependence on agriculture, these changes in climate uh, are, are significant and really are impacting people's livelihoods. That and Nepal, uh, given where it's located in the Asian uh, continent, is the source of water for millions of people downstream in other parts of South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, in many ways, really, uh, climate change is a risk amplifier for this part of the world. And, uh, and so this is compounding challenges that this country uh, already has. Um, Nepal is a landlocked country. It is located just to the north of India. It has three different physiographic zones. The Terai, which is the lowlands on this map that is showing in this PowerPoint, it's green, uh, the lowland areas. Then it has the mid hills or the, the foothills of the uh, Himalaya, which is the sort of lighter green, uh, excuse me, lighter brown uh, shades on this map. And then the darker shades of brown are the highlands, which of course includes uh, Mount Everest. Nepal being located on the Asian uh, subcontinent is subject to very seasonal rainfall called the monsoon, which means the winter is typically dry uh, and the summer is wet. Uh, this is something that is changing with global climate change where uh, more of the, some of the rain is starting to fall in the winter, which the livelihoods are not uh, as ready to uh, be adapted to. Nepal is a tropical highland country, meaning its latitudes are tropical, but because of the, the uh, altitude uh, of the mountains, you have a much greater variability and also much cooler temperatures than would be typically found in tropical uh, latitudes. A few other basics about Nepal. It's a, it's, a, it's a densely populated country of about 30 million people. Um, it is 80% of its population is rural, uh, which is significant. Extremely densely populated at 194 uh, people per square um, kilometer. The totality of the, the spatial extent of the country is about the size of Arkansas. Um, so just a little over 147 square kilometers is the totality of the country uh, size. It is a relatively young population, 
um, with, uh, with a, a, a with significant portion of the population consisting of young people looking for work. Um, it is a very multi-ethnic country and has different castes because of the religion being predominantly Hinduism, which is a religion that has the caste system, which means there's significant segregation between ethnic groups and also religions. Although Hinduism dominates, there's also a significant portion of the country that is Buddhist. Um, the, the Pali language uh, predominates, although there are many other languages spoken as well um, around, the, the, around the country. Uh, Nepali is used as a lingua franca. It is an extremely young democracy with a constitution uh, having only been recently signed. Uh, it has long been a, a, a monarchy um, and it is now, in fact, uh, one of the world's youngest uh, parliamentary democracies. And they were trying to write the constitution while we were in the country back in 2015. It is a landlocked uh, buffer state between India and China, landlocked meaning it has no access to an ocean, so it's highly dependent on India to reach oceanic locations for exporting any of its products. So um, it is today still highly dependent on agriculture, both for its uh, livelihood, just subsistence livelihoods, but also in terms of its production. It's also very dependent on remittances um, meaning uh, uh, money is sent from people from Nepal who, who have moved elsewhere in the world to work. About 25% of its GDP is, in fact, uh, the remittance flow from, particularly from Nepalis who are working in uh, the Arabian Peninsula in various countries uh, as laborers. Its GDP is only about $1,500. Uh, uh, um, its economy is trying to switch from tea to ice. Tea meaning, in this case, tourism, energy, and agriculture. Uh, it's energy coming from hydro, particularly. So tourism, energy, and agriculture. And they're trying to switch their, their economy into one of infrastructure, computerization, and education. But this is a very hard transition to make. It's really one of moving from a developing country to a middle-income country, um, but it needs a, a lot more um, a lot more investment into those dimensions of ICE for that to actually um, in, uh, to happen. So these are some of the things that, that you will you will see in action um, if you take this course on climate change adaptation in Nepal. Um, the course begins in Kathmandu, which is the capital of the of the country. It is the central place. It's the only uh, international airport in the country, and pretty much all roads road lead to and through Kathmandu. Um, it is a city that is located in the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, the city itself is only about a million people, but the whole valley is now 2.5 million. Um, extremely densely populated. Um, it has some environmental challenges in terms of uh, air pollution. It's a valley and with the increase in motorization such as the motorbikes that you see in the photo on the bottom right, um, air pollution has really become an issue. It is an extremely old city with a deep history. The whole valley is in fact a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, with some very specific ones, which you will get a chance to visit as well. Um, some of you may recall that back in April of 2015, there was a massive earthquake in Kathmandu, and this changed uh, many of the uh, sites of, uh, of the uh, World Heritage Site. In fact, the photo you see here, Durbar Square, we took in January 2015, but then the earthquake rearranged this, so it doesn't quite look this way anymore. Um, you will likely get a chance to visit Durbar Square, uh, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and how it looks today. Um, and, uh, but it will look a bit different from these photos, uh, although some of the people will likely look similar. Here's a photo of a, a very typical Hindu holy man. Uh, you see them um, on the street uh, all over Nepal. Um, and what you also see are a lot of these Hindu deities, as Hinduism again dominates. The Hinduism practice in Nepal is one that is 
syncretic with Buddhist ideals, so it's a mixture, although it is considered uh, a, a form of Hinduism. And so uh, part of the cultural landscape of Nepal are these deities that you see uh, everywhere on street corners and in many places. But particularly in central Kathmandu, they are uh, very dense uh, in their uh, part of the landscape. You also see a lot of older uh, older architecture. Some of this, unfortunately, did come tumbling down in that massive earthquake uh, of April 2015. Uh, only some of this is being rebuilt, um, so you may not see quite as much of it anymore, um, but uh, there'll, there'll still be vestiges of it. Here are a few more images of what, uh, what Central Kathmandu and the UNESCO Heritage Site looks like. Uh, a lot of these old temples and buildings uh, left over from uh, times immemorial, in, uh, again, in this location that is so very old. Um, here, an, an example of a Hindu temple that is surrounded by uh, temporary merchants trying to sell you uh, scarves and, and, and cloaks, uh, which is a very uh, a big piece of the, uh, the industry providing uh, the tourists and, and also local people these uh, necessary garments. Um, one of the spectacular sites that was affected by the earthquake is this, uh, this temple complex, which is this main stupa, which is the, uh, the white uh, thing you see with the gold, um, uh, the gold uh, and black uh, features, is called the stupa, which is a Buddhist feature but the shrines in the foreground are all Hindu. This is the one called Swaya ba Balunath, which is also known as the Monkey Temple because there are a lot of monkeys that run around um, wild here uh, that live there and live off the food. You can see some in the corner, uh, uh, the upper right of the image. It is a spectacular site overlooking um, Kathmandu. Again, some of this has been damaged, but hopefully you'll still be able to visit some of it. This is another uh, incredible stupa that you will get to see in Kathmandu. It is Bodhnath. It's the largest stupa in Asia, uh, a major, major Buddhist site. There is no Hindu uh, temple around this. This is strictly a Buddhist site. Um, the surrounding neighborhood has many, uh, many, many different um, Buddhist monasteries and filled with Tibetans who have fled nearby um, Tibet and China. This site is on the way. Uh, between Kathmandu and Lhasa, so it's a little bit north actually of, of Kathmandu and is uh, located on the way to, uh, to the capital city of, uh, of Tibet. Now the course itself um, started and ended in Kathmandu, but it also visited a number of other sites. So here on the map you can see the other places we went. Uh, we went to Cherikot um, in Dolaha district, and we also went to Pohara, which is um, a quintessential tourist destination, but also has many different features for us as a course on uh, climate change adaptation to see. Um, the third place we went to was Chitwan, which is in the lower, uh, the lowlands, not quite completely in the Terai, but in the lowlands, certainly not, uh, not as hilly. So we did visit Locations in three of the, the all three of the of the physiographic regions of um, of the uh, uh, of the country, and got to learn about climate change adaptation in all three of these locations. So, in addition to uh, official lectures that we experience in um, in Kathmandu at the National University, uh, several non-governmental uh, organizations. We also made a lot of different um, community visits in many, um, many parts of the country. And in these community visits, what you get to do is to, to learn from um, local people how it is, what it's like to be living with climate change, how to be adapting on the ground um, with it. And one of the questions we really ponder throughout this course is what is the infrastructure of opportunity in this society? You know, what, what is going on? What, are the, what is the resilience that, built, that is built into the local systems of knowledge, the local, local systems of, of agriculture that, that can be, be adapted to the new circumstances? And how are people coping with these things? So 
um, in uh, in this in this occasion. Uh, here are classmates uh, from the 2015 uh, class. We're being served some tea here. It was a very cold morning. We're all sipping chai with milk uh, as the locals are telling us their stories uh, through a translator of what it's like to, uh, to live there. Um, just a few thoughts about adaptation. And again, you'll be discussing and pondering these during the course. Um, adaptation to climate change refers to an adjustment in the natural and human systems in response to actual and expected stimuli and their effects and how these moderate, uh, how, how this moderates or harms and exploits beneficial opportunities. There are various kinds of adaptation. These can be distinguished between anticipatory and reactive adaptation. And so in these communities, what we're looking for is not just reactive adaptation, but also anticipatory. We know climate is changing in these highland places. So how are communities already anticipating how they need to react. You also have private and public adaptation. So what is the government doing? That's part of what you learn about. But also what are people individually, what are communities doing um, separate from what the government might want to do? And then there are autonomous and very top-down planned adaptation strategies. So all these different kinds are things that you will uh, consider uh, in the field in while you're meeting with people and both formal government officials in university researchers as well as people on the ground. This is your typical uh, transportation as you go around um, the, uh, the country um, because in 2015 we were a large group we had to use a, a bus. Likely in 2017 you'll be a smaller group, just graduate students. So um, hopefully the vehicle will be a little smaller. Key is that the vehicle has high clearance because the roads, as you'll see in some, the next few slides, are, are pretty rough. Um, but the, the adventure is definitely in, in the travel. Um, here we are leaving Kathmandu. Um, you see mountains in the background. You also see terraces for rice. And you see a lot of smoke from brick kilns. This is where they're making bricks, which is where, how they build a lot of their structures. This is a deeply inscribed cultural landscape. Again, many thousands of years of occupancy, different groups on top of each other, uh, and, and building on um, prior a uh, civilization. So uh, there are people everywhere, and they have really crafted this landscape to look as it does. Here is a road. This is the road to uh, to Cherrycott. Um, this is your typical highway, uh, uh, nothing like what you might imagine a highway to be in the United States, but this is a good road. Um, very, very many buses and vehicles that transport multiple people at once. There are very few private cars, and when they are being used, they're, they are almost all high occupancy vehicles. Very few people travel alone in a the car. They're always sharing rides, um, and there are just not that many private vehicles around. There are uh, motorcycles being used privately, um, but most people travel by bus or walk. Uh, every bus has a driver and an assistant, and they this assistant helps um, in terms of the, the very narrow conditions. And there's a lot of honking, which is a form of communication between the uh, trucks and the buses on these roads. Um, this road rises up about 1,800 um, meters out of the Sunkoshi uh, Valley. Here, again, we're um, going up really high, up above a stream on the right-hand side of your slide. This little uh, collection of buildings is the high point of the road up to Cherry Cot. Um, this is a place called Mude, and there's some little stores you could stop off and get something to drink or not. It is definitely a very a dizzying experience, um, not for the faint of heart. If you uh, if you're ha are uncomfortable in being in a in vehicles for long periods of time and at a high altitude and on narrow roads, this may not be the course for you. Um, it's uh, it's not good for people who suffer from um, uh, from getting car sick because uh, it is a very very challenging uh, terrain. 
Um, here we are crossing the uh, the Sunkoshi River. This is the, the road to China from Kathmandu. Um, as you can see, the road's not very wide. Again, that's very typical of, um, of Nepal. Um, here we are visiting a site of a massive landslide that uh, occurred here in 2014 uh, that blocked the river and in fact they had to bulldoze the channels through the blockage so as not to cause uh, massive uh, problems downstream. Um, this landslide buried several villages killing 156 people. Um, many of them have never been found. This is, a, this is an example of something that is happening with, with global climate change where there is an increase in hazards, an increase in vulnerability to these hazards uh, as landscapes uh, experience rainfall in different and more intense patterns. Uh, in some of these places, the shear is too intense and the land is uh, coming down. So this is, this is definitely something to to think about and anticipate in the future, are there more uh, communities that are perhaps located too precipitously on the landscape that perhaps should be moved so as not to undergo a landslide such as occurred here. Here's another visual of that same dam on the, uh, the Sunkoshi River. Again, the military were called in to bulldoze it so that it wouldn't um, back up and then overtop the new bank because then that would have caused massive flooding and issues downstream. This is the uh, small community of Cherrycott where we spent a few days. It's in Dolacha district in, in uh, Nepal, very high location. It's located at almost 2,000 meters of altitude. Uh, so <clears throat> again, if you suffer from any sort of high altitude challenges, um, this, this may be a problem. Um, everybody had to adjust to it slowly. But a spectacular location with, um, we visited many communities in this area, um, many practicing subsistence farming, uh, including a mixture of dairy as well as terraces used to, to level, uh, to create some fields to, to grow paddy, which is rice and also wheat and, and many vegetables. Terraces are ubiquitous throughout Nepal uh, and are used to grow any number of things. Again, the land is naturally much too steep to grow anything on, so people have uh, terraced it uh, in order to grow any sort of uh, crops. Uh, wheat, barley, maize, also mustard seed, lentils, and some higher value um, crops. Um, including what we ate a lot of, uh, which was a cauliflower. But uh, here's some cauliflower that we, uh, we saw a lot of being grown. It's a higher value crop. And so uh, there's actually attempts at encouraging farmers to get away from just growing wheat and, and barley and, and maize and things like that and to invest more in um, things like cauliflower, which bring them a greater income and bring it to market. Of course, in order to do so, you have to have the infrastructure in place to market the crop uh, when it's ripe uh, and without spoilage. Uh, so there's some challenges in terms of infrastructure and supply chain that have to be uh, de developed alongside of uh, encouraging farmers to switch to these kinds of, of crops. Um, similarly, we saw efforts at um, growing things like tea and coffee, especially organic types uh, that can be attractive. They are higher value, can be stored easily, and on an international market can yield a higher price. Um, one thing that we also witnessed is that in addition to these, these terraces, there are now adaptations to extend the season using plastic. You can see some white areas on the slide. Uh, where people are using plastic to try to extend their season to grow certain crops longer into the winter. Um, also places are doing irrigation where perhaps they didn't need it before, but because of the variability of water uh, in the seasons, people are now starting to consider it. Um, dairy is very important. Um, again, I mentioned there's an integration of, of, of cattle, dairy cattle with, uh, with cropping systems. Uh, very important in terms of, of cat, having cows, buffalo, and also yak 
milk, and which is converted into products such as yogurt and ghee, which is very important to the cuisine of the region. Um, and working on the infrastructure uh, to improve the uh, centralized points, um, ensuring quality economies of scale. These are things that are uh, can really improve livelihoods for people. Uh, it does require electricity, which the government of Nepal is providing both uh, centrally, but also in terms of solar delivery in places. So you'll be learning uh, about that in the course. You'll also be learning about community forestry systems. Firewood is extremely important source of um, uh, fuel for both cooking and heating. And uh, so uh, Nepal is well known for massive deforestation a number of decades ago, but a lot of effort has been made at reforestation uh, particularly to stabilize mountainsides from erosion and, um, and also to provide firewood, uh, fast growing uh, timber for firewood as a resource in these areas. Um, in this inset slide, you see uh, women carrying bundles of wood uh, in their uh, in the way that they do so in the pollen. And here you see it stacked up, ready to be used to be burned again for either wood or for, um, uh, or excuse me, for, for uh, heating, for, for the heat inside the homes, but also for cooking uh, fuel. Um, there is cultural preference for firewood as a source of cooking fuel. Um, there's also great pride in, in having your, your firewood stacked a particular way and uh, to demonstrate that you have a lot of it available. Um, so efforts to introduce more efficient cook stoves have, are challenging because there's such a cultural desire for, uh, for fire, the use of firewood. So there's a lot of uh, ex experiments being done with improving, improving cook stoves so that the indoor air pollution is reduced. This meets with resistance because of the changes in taste of food and just cultural ways of doing things. But slowly there, by working with people, there are slowly efforts being made to produce more efficient uh, cook stoves to, uh, to still use the wood, but to use it more efficiently and without the indoor pollution that it often produces. Um, a big effort is also being made to use biogas, which is uh, a, a byproduct of composted manure, uh, both, both household collected manure and, and from animals. This then local, used locally uh, can produce a gas that uh, can be used to cook with. And this is uh, very uh, encouraging developments that can, again, recycle uh, waste products from households uh, and put them to use and then diminishing the need for firewood. Speaking of cooking, um, the food was great in Nepal. Um, it's uh, very much sort of along the lines of Indian food, very friendly towards uh, vegetarians. Uh, the Nepali, Nepal set means rice dal, which is a, a lentil, usually made with black lentils. Um, we ate a lot of cauliflower curry and some sort of relish with, with wilted greens and, um, and rice. Um, meat can be provided if you want it, but often wasn't. It can be chicken or, or beef, uh, but absolutely not necessary. In fact, many meals were without Meat. It's a very balanced meal, usually produced very uh, fresh, very little processed food. So um, you, will, you will eat well um, while you are in Nepal. Uh, cooking makes me think of women because cooking is still predominantly a women's task in Nepal. And you will be learning about the gender dimensions of climate change adaptation uh, in a country such as Nepal. A lot of women are more vulnerable to climate change issues because of the risks and also because of cultural norms regarding their role uh, in the household. So, um, so these are some, some social dimensions that you will be looking at uh, when you visit the country. Um, obviously, one can't generalize and given the ethnic and cultural diversity in Nepal, you'll see different expressions of this. Um, Hinduism in general 
is uh, is patriarchal, um, uh, but and and uh, but so there are issues for women that way, uh, much less so in the Buddhist societies in Nepal, um, but there uh, even within castes and then within the ethnic groups there was variation on this. Um, one of the reasons why uh, biofuel, um, the, the, the biogas, is, is really something that is being, being pushed is uh, also that it's a use, way of using human waste, human fecal matter. Um, in Nepal, only about 50% of the urban population has access to sanitation. Uh, in the rural areas, it is a lot less, which means that there are very few toilets. And in fact, the cultural habit is to relieve oneself in fields and outdoors. And there are efforts, as this sign uh, can in indicates, is, is there's efforts being made now to, um, to teach people to use toilets um, as they're being built. Um, a lot of them are squat toilets, as you see in the left corner. Um, very rudimentary sanitary um, facilities. Um, this is definitely a little bit of a reality check for those of you who are squeamish about such things. Uh, be prepared. Um, but it is it is changing. It is a, a cultural change as Nepal develops more and efforts are being made to up uh, its sanitation. Uh, these, these, these dimensions are changing. But it will be a topic of conversation, I can assure you. Um, as you travel around the country. One thing that Nepal has grabbed onto very quickly is the use of cell phones. Um, here, in fact, we're leapfrogging over landlines uh, and cell access is quite ubiquitous. It, in fact, beats parts of the U.S. in terms of coverage. It was impressive. Our uh, instructor, Amir Pudel, uh, pictured here with his cell phone to his ear um, this is something he was, we, we, he, he did a lot as he was planning for the course uh, on the fly and it was really impressive how much connectivity was maintained through, uh, through cell phones. Uh, again, tourism is, is a big piece of the, um, of the economy of, um, of Nepal. And um, that will remain, even though there are efforts to make it become less dependent on tourism. But the reality is with the mountain landscapes, the exotic uh, features of the cultures, and the uh, various other amazingly attractive things about Nepal, we'll, make, we'll keep Nepal as a tourist destination. Um, this is Pohara, a town that, that you'll visit. Um, you'll also have your, your down day there, and you can go parasailing here, do a few of the, of the, a little bit more of the tourist things. Uh, we'll also hike part of the Annapurna Trail, uh, which is just a spectacular uh, a hiking trek that is done by many who come from far away to do just that. Um, uh, other features of the, of the tourist landscape are uh, the elephant rides at Chitwan National Park. Um, Chitwan is, is a very, very important uh, National Park for the Conservation of the Rhino. Uh, these are Asian elephants and the best way to do a safari in the park is to do it on the elephants because the other wildlife is much less threatened by the presence of elephants than by car uh, or by jeep. Uh, so this was this was a, a very very cool experience that, that we did and, and uh, had us discuss the role of biodiversity in a, in a developing country and what's happening to that biodiversity with climate change um, in, uh, in a place like, like Nepal. Uh, here we are at the Annapurna conservation area where you can do, you can hike from community to community and do homestays. Um, very impressive and emerging and improving uh, infrastructure available there for, for tourists. Here again, we're at Chitwan, and we get to see the rhino from our, um, our elephant uh, perches. Uh, many other things to, uh, to see there and to uh, behold. Um, as I said, while we were there, the Nepalese government was trying to write its constitution, which is a very challenging thing to do in a multi multicultural, multi-ethnic country. Uh, that meant that there were some demonstrations by the Maoists, and uh, periodically we got stuck, 
stuck in in uh, in traffic backups. Um, because we were considered a tourist uh, group, we had what are called green plates, and they truly are green plates, and it at times let us get through what were blockades on roads and things like that. Um, but it's certainly something to be aware of uh, as you travel in a country like Nepal, where, where democracy is still in its infancy, that not everybody's happy with the state of affairs and that they uh, will express themselves. So um, it can be exciting, a little bit scary. We were never, there, safety was never a concern for us, but again, something that does need to be kept in the back of one's mind of traveling in a country like Nepal. Um, here, this building is a, a place in the Tarai. It's a climate change adaptation information center. Uh, it's an outfit to channel money that is being directed at Nepal. So one thing you're going to learn about is how climate change adaptation is really a new form of development aid. Um, and so there are many different efforts, different non-governmental organizations that have cropped up to channel money that is being spent on helping Nepal adapt uh, from the developing world. So you know, German, European efforts, North American ones, they're sending, they're sending money to Nepal to help Nepal adapt to climate change. And these kinds of organizations are being set up to uh, to channel that money to do something with it. So you'll visit some of these, um, and uh, what you will also learn is that a number of students are now now studying this. So development studies or development finance or some of the degree programs that uh, some of our uh, Nepalese students were pursuing in order to work in this new and emerging um, industry in the country. So how is Nepal adapting to climate change? Well, it's it's really, it's a lot of it is attention to economic development, but with an environmental twist to it. Um, it, it does send people out uh, and for their remittances. That maybe is not an explicit strategy, but it's certainly an implicit one. Um, more explicitly is the experimentation with new crops and new varieties, new crop varieties, to the new realities of the climate and moisture regimes and the different uh, valleys and, and mountains. Um, also different approaches to marketing of products, attention to supply chain, trying to add value to to products that are already grown, trying to get them further into the supply chain. Um, irrigation and season extenders, as I mentioned earlier, is being experimented with. And then um, a lot of emphasis on education and, and the increase of human resource potential. So all of this are things that you will uh, be exposed to and have a chance to read about and discuss and learn about in person and think about more broadly. Uh, so with that, I will close and uh, say namaste, which is the greeting that you use in, in Nepal. You close your, uh, your palms of your hands to each other and say and have a slight nod of your head and you say namaste. There is not typically handshaking or, or hugs there, but this greeting of namaste which some of you may know from your yoga class, but here it's used in everyday practice. Anyway, it's a really, really exciting course, very intensive. Uh, you will be exhausted, but you will be stimulated with many, many different aspects. Uh, of really a profound experience, highly recommended. Please get in touch with Jerry Burgess if you're interested in going, and please take the prereq course, which is offered in the fall online, taught by Amir Pudel, uh, taught um, uh, the climate change at the front lines. And uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.